Um, Teresa, so excited to have you here. She's going to do our first didactic component for our first echo session. And she is doing, the title is, um, you know, really, again, using data to drive improvement, you know, the importance of doing that. And she's going to take a dive into that together. She is, as she mentioned, the Chief Quality Officer at Penasa Community Health Center. And she analyzes data related to 65,000 patients and more than 140 clinical providers uh, looking for trends at the practice and at provider level. She then uses this data to guide changes in their workflows and processes within the organization with the goals to improve patient outcomes, pride and staff efficiency, quality, patient safety, and ultimately, of course, improve outcomes. She works very closely with administrative leaders across the organization on process and performance improvement and developing systems to change, and she continually reviews measurements and data associated with these processes to objectively determine what, if, it's, if the process is working. So again, we're excited to have you as faculty and as our first presenter. So Teresa, we're gonna turn this over to you. Great. Um, thanks for having me. Um, we can go to the next slide and sort of dive right in. We have about 10 to 15 more minutes. Um, we can go ahead one more slide as well. So just quick, um, my sort of uh, stance on this is what we measure uh, gets done and we can actually see um, distinct changes uh, when we're measuring uh, what we do. So uh, next slide. So just a quick overview from my perspective and why we use data here and why we should be looking at data. Um, I'm purposeful in putting these in order of priority for us in our organization, and I would challenge you to think about these in, in this specific order. So from my perspective, uh, we use data uh, to improve patient care first and foremost. So our goal on a day-to-day -day basis is to do better than we did the day before and to take um, outstanding care of our patients. Um, and so that's why we're looking at data and why we're collecting it. We also look at it from a patient safety perspective. So much of the data we uh, produce and look at and analyze on a day-to-day -day basis is really trying to make sure what we're providing for care um, is safe and effective. And then there are times when we use data to educate, and so it could be our staff, um, it could be our providers. As you know, many of the guidelines change day-to-day, -day, um, and it's really hard um, in healthcare, I think, to stay on top of the guideline changes. And so uh, at times, we can use data to show uh, providers that the guidelines have changed uh, and that they need to change their practice. So um, that's been useful. What we'll talk a lot about today and, and how I think data will intersect this work is really the fourth one, where we're using data to assess, uh, modify, change the workflows and the processes in the practice. Um, and so if we're putting in a change or you're implementing a PDSA cycle, it's super important to be able to look at the data and see if that was effective, if the workflow actually has changed, um, if we have to continue to modify that, um, or if there's been some success. Um, data also allows providers and their staff to manage a whole population. So what we're talking about here, uh, obviously, is the population of pre-adolescent or adolescents making sure that they get their vaccines. But we can use data to look at, you know, our patients with diabetes, our heart disease, heart failure. Um, and so it, it's really super helpful uh, for us to use it in that manner. Um, it also allows us to look at the quality of a service that we provide or, you know, at our entire organization level. Uh, so if we want to be able to say, you know, our care management uh, department provides outstanding quality, if we're not really measuring anything or providing data, it's really hard to sort of back up uh, what we're saying. So we can use that to really look at the, the quality of services we provide. We use it for reporting often. I know all of you have to report at various levels, so we, we absolutely use data uh, for that purpose. We also use it to write for grants to show need. Uh, and show why we might need to, to have some funding like we're using right here uh, to be able to move some of our quality improvement projects forward. And then lastly, and I, and I point this out, when I, when I share data with providers or their teams, medical assistants, the first thing they feel like we're using it uh, for is to evaluate them, right? That it's a report card or it's a scorecard uh, or we're keeping track of them. And I, I'm purposeful in saying that from my perspective, evaluation is the least important of all of these things. And so I'm purposeful in putting this uh, last. So there are times when we use it for credentialing, we use it for peer review, we use it for their annual evaluation, but that really is the least important reason why we're looking at data. Next slide. Um, so one of the first things you need to ask yourself, particularly for this particular grant, 
is, you know, what's the type of data that we're going to measure? So from my perspective, there are two really big hunks of data. It can either be quantitative or qualitative. Um, quant uh, from quantitative, the, the easiest way to remember that is it's, you know, quant and quantity. So the amount or, you know, actual data that can be measured uh, or in numbers. Um, so in our you know, case here, it could be the number of vaccines that we've given, the number of well child visits, the number of total patients we've seen, the total number of visits. Uh, qualitative really looks at um, descriptions or things that we can observe uh, or the quality of what we're providing. And so typically that's non-numeric and it can be examples of, um, you know, that I've listed here. In our case, it could be you know, the ease of the workflow that we put in place or, um, you know, how helpful whatever we're doing. Uh, so much of the time we're, you know, this can be staff interviews, it can be patient interviews, um, uh, and those can be some of the things that we look at. Next slide. Also, when we're looking at sort of the, the data that we're gonna measure, um, it's super important to think about the audience that you're going to, um, be uh, trying to encourage a change for. So if I'm gonna go into a practice and say, I think we really need to work on HPV vaccinations and this is the reason why, um, if I'm talking to a provider, it's super important to come at them maybe with qualitative in addition to the actual numbers. Um, they wanna know how it's gonna impact their patients. They wanna know how it's gonna impact them. They wanna make sure it's gonna be helpful and improve outcomes for patients and care for patients and that it's gonna be helpful for them. If I'm going to talk to a CFO who uh, looks at the finances, um, they may not want to be talking about patients. They want, they want to be looking at the numbers and how much is it gonna cost. And if you want this extra person to be doing this work, what's the return on investment gonna be like? So it really depends on the audience and how you're picking either quantitative or qualitative data and how you're gonna present it uh, and display that. Uh, in selecting data, it can also depend on how easy or difficult it is to collect or how much cost or resources it's going to take to collect that. So chart audits may be the best way to do it, but if it takes a lot of time um, and you don't really have many uh, staff members to do that or it's super costly, you may decide that chart audits really aren't the, the most effective way to get at what you're trying to, um, to demonstrate. So it really, it, it, um, sort of your selection and your decision can be based on some of those things. Um, I would also mention if you need this data to be sort of projectable, meaning you're gonna need, you're looking at maybe a subset in your PDSA of 12 patients or 15 patients, but that eventually you want it to, to apply to all 65,000 patients here. If you're thinking you're gonna do it um, manually, that might be okay for 15 patients, but if you need to project that to the entire population, that won't be uh, doable. So, you know, depending on, on, um, on what your need is will determine uh, the type of data that you're gonna measure and how you're gonna get it. Um, and then what I would say is that oftentimes, um, it's super important to get both types of data, right? Quantitative, meaning it's a measure, and then qualitative, meaning it's a description or you know, describing the, the quality of, of what we're doing. So sometimes the most effective data to display or to review and to collect are both types. So you can actually get at um, impacting a person from, from both directions. Next slide. Um, just a, this is something just just uh, Reed says often and just to uh, remind that, that not every change or not every PDSA cycle that we put in place is an improvement, right? So we hope it's gonna be, uh, but when we go through this whole um, process where we're, we're sitting down with our team, we're, we're identifying what our plan's gonna be, we identify what we're gonna do and who's gonna do it, we look at, you know, we come back after a period of time and we look at the results, uh, we study it, um, and then we either act on modifying that PDSA, we throw the PDSA completely away, uh, start fresh, um, you know, everything we put in place might not be truly successful. And so we have to either repeat, uh, meaning we change it slightly and do it again, or we just get rid of the whole cycle and try something new. Um, so uh, super important to keep that in mind. And then next slide. 
Um, so one of the things I would encourage you um, to do, and I know many of you have already started working on your baseline vaccination rates, but um, it's super, super important for you to think about what you're going to use, what data source you're going to use for your um, baseline. So from my perspective, thinking about this project, there are a few different things you can select, and obviously each mechanism has its own advantages and disadvantages. So from my perspective, if you can pull it directly from your uh, electronic medical record or EHR, that's best. What we know is that not all of us have um, an easy way to pull that data out, or it may be costly for us to get this new report generated. Uh, or we may not be entering data in any sort of discrete field, so we can't pull it currently as our baseline from the EHR. Um, but there are definitely, you know, if you can build it and then an ongoing basis have, uh, you know, a data person or your quality person or, a, you know, a medical assistant be able to just push a button and can give you that data in real time, that obviously would be best practice. But again, uh, really challenging for many of us. Some of us can just use the registry. So in this case, it would be impact at the state level. Um, again, super helpful. The advantage would be that everyone is sort of um, uh, send, putting that data into the registry across the state. And so you're looking at uh, wherever that patient received care, potentially having documentation of those vaccines in their system. Obviously, there are many disadvantages. Uh, from my perspective, you have less control over that registry, that data, how valid that data is, how accurate, how timely. Uh, it feels like every time they change the registry, it does impact um, our rates. And so it's really hard to tell whether the change we saw in the rates was due to an actual PDSA we put in place, or either positive or negative, or if it truly is um, an error. So we have less control over that mechanism. Uh, from my perspective. And then chart review, I kind of mentioned, um, it does allow you to see, get sort of in the weeds and identify maybe in the moment when you're reviewing charts, what might have been going on and why they chose to either uh, administer the vaccine or not. But again, super time intensive, uh, requires a lot of resources and it's not um, scalable. The other thing uh, for you is to decide what you're going to assess. Um, so are you going to look at all three adolescent vaccines? So are you going to look at meningococcal, Tdap, and HPV? Is that something that would be important for you uh, when you're uh, sort of identifying whether uh, your uh, change is being helpful? Are you looking at uh, just the first dose, the second dose, both? Uh, what's the age range? Are you looking at 11 and 12 year olds? Um, are you trying to look at whether it was done by their 13th birthday or their end of the 13th birthday? Are you looking at it at the practice level, at the organizational level, the provider level? Those are all sort of decisions that I think are super helpful. And I would encourage you that even if you make one of those decisions, um, it doesn't mean you can't change it moving forward. So as an example, we started at the practice level. Uh, we got the most buy-in that way. And then as we got more sophisticated and as we got more engagement with the providers, you know, they really wanted to look at it at the provider level. So uh, there's no wrong decision here. Uh, from my perspective, the more data you're looking at, the easier it is to see where the breakdowns might be. Next step, or next slide, sorry. Um, so just talking a little bit about how we determined our baseline when we started doing this work several years ago. Um, I met with our data team and the sort of the staff member who's responsible for the EMR, the training on the use of the EMR and embedding new uh, fields. Uh, we mapped out our current workflow. We identified sort of the discrete fields behind the scenes. We asked our data team to look to see, you know, are those fields really reportable? Um, could they retrieve our data? And then we created what we call a summary sheet of all the specs. So if you've ever had to work with IT or data folks, um, they have their own sort of language. And then the clinical folks have their own sort of language. And so at times, you know, I think I'm very clear as a quality person of what I want the data to look like and what fields I want them to pull and how they're going to build the report. And it doesn't necessarily compute to IT language or data language. And so sometimes there's a, a true barrier there. So what we found really helpful 
is before we start running a report, we sit down with them and we create a summary sheet. So I would say things like, I want this age range, this reporting period, this sex, these, you know, in this case, vaccines, um, and uh, here are the discrete fields. And so we build that, I approve it, and then they start building the report. Um, I think sometimes what happens is usually they'll just build the report and then you look at it and say, oh my gosh, this isn't, exa this isn't what I wanted at all. Uh, and then they have to start from scratch. So for us, best practice really has become trying to uh, do a summary sheet. Next slide, got to go fast. Just quickly, this is a couple excerpts of our summary sheet um, and uh, just an easy way for us to know that we've got all of the right uh, fields in place. Next slide. Just giving you a two minute warning, Teresa. Yes, thank you. Uh, the next step is really super important to validate the data. So when you get the report out, um, having a staff member go in and actually make sure all of those things we wanted really are what's being um, uh, measured. And, um, and then uh, doing at least 20 chart audits and identifying whether uh, the patients who were not pulled to the report as being compliant truly weren't getting the vaccines in this case, and those who pulled to the report as being compliant did get uh, those vaccines. So just making sure the report's accurate. Next step, next slide. Um, so then how to display and present the data. So there are really sort of two big categories. From my perspective, you can either de-identify the data or have it fully transparent. Again, advantages, disadvantages to either way. If you've never really given data to teams and or providers, uh, de-identifying it can be a really non-threatening way to start presenting the data. Um, Although uh, fully transparent, and this is how we sort of present the data, uh, allows you to identify best practices across the organization. So you can identify the person who's doing super well and allow those people who might be struggling to work with that person and identify what their best practices are. Do they have scripts? Do they have their MA do something that might be unique? Are they starting at an earlier age? Um, those are all things that uh, you can put into place and identify uh, ahead of time by looking at the data. Next slide. Um, so this was just our baseline data. I won't get into as much detail, but you can see our HPV rates were much lower than our meningococcal and Tdap rates. So it told us that we had placed sort of a lesser value on the importance of that vaccine. So our initial PDSA uh, was centered around that. Next slide. Uh, just another way to trend the data. So this was a trending. We started in December uh, 2014, and we continue to look at that over a long period of time. So it allows us to sort of see how we're doing in real time and see if there have been any changes or maybe workflows we had put in place had sort of dropped off. Uh, next slide. Um, we also chose to break down our male vaccination trending uh, compared to our females to see if there were differences in the way in which we were uh, recommending these vaccines. So next slide, you can see um, they look very similar. So what it, this told me was that the vast majority, the, the workflow we had in place, uh, we were pretty much adopting for, um, for females and males, uh, but it also showed in these trending that you know, we still have a huge issue with our second dose vaccine, right? So we're getting closer and closer with our first uh, dose vaccine for both males and females to getting up to the, the same rates as the other adolescent vaccines, but still have uh, room to move. Next step. And then lastly, um, this was just a way for us, uh, like I mentioned, to move to the next level. So we did not lead with breaking out the data by provider, but now we're at a place where, again, it's not sh from coming from a place of shame or blame, but it's coming from a, a quality improvement and a teaching perspective. So if I'm Sydney Catrades on the right, um, I want to know what Dr. Lauer is doing on the left, right? So she's got a fair number of people who don't have any um, doses at all, a high uh, rate of those with just one dose and a very low rate with both doses. So I wanna work with the providers to the left to kind of see what their workflow might look like. Um, and next slide. So that's, um, that's that. Just any questions? Uh, I'm not sure if we have time for that, so I'll defer to Jess.
Thank you, Teresa. That was awesome. Really appreciate that taking the deep dive. I think that the, you know the having that didactic as we're starting and everyone's kind of doing their baseline data is is just perfect timing. I think what we'll do is we'll see we'll have time at the 